Right on. So what I was going to talk about today is uh, provide an introduction to the basics of configuring something called Envoy, Envoy Proxy, right? Uh, which is a, a, a really uh, critical technology in a lot of different service mesh implementations. Um, and feel free to jump in anywhere. I have a slide that reminds people, feel free to jump anywhere if you have questions. So don't worry about interrupting or anything. Just speak up, raise your hand using the Zoom feature, whatever works, it's all good. Um, so um, that's that's what I'm going to do. And we'll just see how, uh, you know, how time goes. So uh, right here we go. Okay, so just kind of set my set expectations for everyone, like interrupt, interrupt me as much as you want. It's cool, let's make this interactive. Feel free to ask questions. Um, if you know something about what I'm talking about, feel free to jump in and share your experience. Um, I do have some demos um, that I had planned on doing. And so if you wanted to kind of try and follow along or something, if you have your own environment, um, you can certainly do that. And I have some information on the environment that I use. Uh, so you have an idea of sort of like what I used to create the demos. And you could go and, and, and recreate it and uh, we'll go from there. So, um, so well, I want to start out first uh, with sort of a quick discussion on the general architecture of a service mesh. Um, the idea behind a service mesh, <clears throat> predominantly you see coming out in containerized environments, it, it sort of rose up with the rise of popularity of Kubernetes and the deployment of containerized applications onto Kubernetes. But if we stop and think about it, the general architecture of a service mesh, there's really nothing about a service mesh that has to be specific to Kubernetes or containers, okay? Um, in, in very generic terms, a service mesh is made up of a couple different components. First, you have a control plane. Um, and I'll talk about what that control plane does in just a moment, right? Um, and this control plane is gonna communicate um, over a communications channel with one or more data planes. Um, and, or you may refer to this as, as just the data plane. Some uh, folks like to refer to all of the areas where data gets passed as, as the data plane, right? Um, so either one is fine. Um, so, and then behind um, those data planes or communicating through the data plane are these applications or services or workloads, right? Um, and the idea is that we can use a service mesh to um, bring about consistent sort of policy application and connectivity requirements uh, without having to actually modify the way the application or the service or the workload actually works, right? So it continues to work the same way it always has worked. And we sort of offload the functionality of saying, I want to do things like mutual TLS, or I want to enforce policies. I want to make sure that I have rate limiting or anything of that nature. We, we offload all that onto the service mesh. Um, if you're familiar at all with, uh, you know, sort of the idea behind network virtualization, which is a term that VMware has championed um, over the years since they introduced their NSX product. And for background, I helped bootstrap that product when I was at VMware years ago, um, working directly for the co-founder of, of NYSERA. Um, this looks a lot like that, but instead of being specific to sort of like connecting VMs, we're connecting specific applications or specific services, right? Um, so what does this control plane do? The control plane is responsible for integrating with other systems to sort of figure out what services are out there and how I communicate with them. It's responsible for managing the configuration of the mesh, which includes you know, policies for how traffic should be moved and uh, you know, what services are available and how things are reached across the mesh, that sort of thing. And then it programs that data plane by, by passing information from the control plane down to the data plane in a way the data plane understands, right? Um, and it's important to note that in, in uh, situations like this, the control plane is what we would refer to as out of band. So it doesn't sit in line between two workloads that are communicating. It's not like we're channeling all the traffic up through the data plane, right? Instead, we have up through the control plane. Instead, we have distributed data planes that are placed really, really close to each of the workloads. And they're only responsible for managing the traffic that's moving in and out of that particular workload. The data plane, on the other hand, is responsible for actually passing traffic back and forth. So this is the piece that actually moves packets to and from the workloads, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, these workloads, again, in, in, in a, you know, a practical sense, there's nothing about a service mesh that's specific to containers. We see it often associated with Kubernetes and containers, but there's really nothing that requires that. So I could run a service mesh that has VMs in it or even bare metal systems in it, right, and containers. So whatever that workload is, whatever that compute load is behind it, that's what the data plane is communicating with. 
And this is what we would refer to as in-band. So it actually does sit in line between the workload and wherever that workload is communicating with. So it has to be really lightweight and has to be really high performant, right? Um, and so these components sort of make up what is a service mesh. Now, service meshes uh, often end up sort of being very opinionated. So if you think about something like, like Istio, for example, right, which is the very, very well-known name in service mesh, it's really a Kubernetes only thing, right? Um, but you can tell by the architecture that I've just described here, there's really nothing specific to Kubernetes here. It, Kubernetes makes it a little bit easier to do certain things like service discovery that are a little more challenging when you're out in the VM world, but there's nothing preventing you from being able to do that. Now, we talked about how, um, you know, this, this presentation focused on something called Envoy, but what is Envoy and where does it fit into this sort of bigger picture, right? Envoy is um, designed to be that data plane. So it was specifically designed to be a high performance um, data plane that was sort of designed for service mesh architectures, right? Originally created um, uh, by Lyft, um, then open sourced and donated to the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, is now one of a number of graduated projects. Um, so projects that the CNCF considers fully mature, very, very, um, you know, sort of well-established. There's a great, um, a, a robust um, community, uh, both users and contributors and maintainers. One of the cool things about Envoy is that it can be dynamically configured. So uh, you don't just, you can just pass it like a, a configuration file and start it up and say, here, do this. But we can also pass it configuration values dynamically over an API. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, and of course it has all these advanced features, you know, sort of uh, multiple load balancing um, algorithms that you can use and automatic retries if there's an error and circuit breaking, which means if you know something uh, doesn't respond a little bit, then uh, doesn't respond to the load, then we can we can sort of um, break that circuit and and keep from cascading failures, reaching the rest of your distributed system, et cetera, et cetera. And has first class support for the latest protocols, so HTTP two, HTTP three, gRPC among others, right? So it's a really really powerful um, tool, um, and you see it used in a lot of different service mesh uh, applications. So Istio uses Envoy as the data plane. Um, uh, Kong's uh, open source project, uh, Kuma uses Envoy as the data plane. And then uh, the, the paid Kong Mesh product, which is based on Kuma, uh, obviously then also uses Envoy. Um, there are other um, source mesh products out there. I believe the product by Solo um, uses Envoy as their data plane as well, and there are others. So it's, it's, it's really um, seeing a lot of uptick in the, in the service mesh space. And so that's kind of the reason I want to talk about Envoy is regardless of what service mesh you're going to be using, um, there's a pretty good chance you're going to be working with Envoy. And um, so if we spend some time talking about understanding how Envoy works and what the components of the configuration are, that'll really just kind of help you understand what the service mesh is doing and sort of what it can do for you um, when it's taking your configuration, these policies and stuff you're writing and passing them down into uh, Envoy. So uh, Envoy um, has a, a pretty complex, uh, well, I shouldn't say it's pretty complex. It can be complex. It can also be pretty simple but it has a good number of different components in its configuration. And I've got two examples here and I'll, 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 when I move into the demo phase, I'll show sort of like more real world versions of this, right? But um, it starts with a listener and a listener is simply just a way for Envoy to receive traffic, right? And that listener is associated with an IP address um, and a port. Now that IP address might be all zeros, meaning you know, any IP address, but this port, or it could be a specific IP address, you know, 192.168.100.10, uh, whatever. And uh, traffic that enters Envoy bound for that IP address and or that port um, gets captured by that listener and then uh, passes through the rest of Envoy to get to its final destination. Um, every listener also has an associated set of filters. Now, filters are sort of like plugins, if you will, for Envoy, they determine how Envoy does what it's going to do with traffic. Now, in the two examples, uh, there are the two diagrams that I'm showing here. The top one represents um, using a filter like uh, a TCP proxy filter, where we are having Envoy act as a, a layer four proxy. And what I mean by that is we are taking traffic on, let's say, traffic that's bound for MySQL, 
right? Um, and we are just looking at it at layer four. So, you know, TCP address or UDP ad or IP address and then TCP port, you know, what is, what is uh, uh, MySQL 3316, I think it is, right? And so it's just looking at that layer four stuff. It doesn't have any sort of higher level application knowledge about what that traffic is doing or what it is. Um, and so you, that's an example of using a TCP filter. Now, Envoy also has the ability to like have some of that higher level application knowledge. So if in this bottom diagram, I'm showing an example of what the components would look like if we were using their HTTP filter, which then allows us to, it sees traffic on, you know, on a, a particular IP address, and then it's a TCP traffic, and it's either, you know, port 80 or port 443, or it's another port that we've explicitly told on, boy, this is HTTP traffic. At that point, then it can actually unpack that traffic and look at what is the host that we're asking for, what are the headers that are being made in the request, what is the path, what are the, uh, the query parameters that are being submitted, all this kind of stuff, all this high level HTTP knowledge can be included and uh, sort of um, you know, unwrapped by Envoy to then make decisions about what we're going to do with it. If you're using something like that, then there's an additional component uh, that you see here called routes. And that's where we can go in and we can say, well, if you're asking for you know, www.site1.com, I want you to go one way. And if you're asking for www.site2.com, I want you to go to a different way. And if you're asking for www.site3.com, I want you to go yet an entirely different way, right? Or even if you're saying uh, you're all going to the same host, but slash API goes to one definite destination, slash API slash V1 goes to a different destination, slash API slash V2 goes to a third destination, et cetera, et cetera. And, that, and it does that because it has this layer seven knowledge. So Envoy can be both a layer four proxy as well as a layer seven proxy, right? Either way, once it makes it through the way through the filters and you may have routes, though that all informs it in terms of like, where does that traffic need to go? What is the destination for that traffic? And the destination is represented by a cluster. And a cluster simply says, I'm responsible for managing or responding to the requests that you've received, right? Um, and then every cluster has one or more endpoints, right? Um, so a cluster might be a single endpoint, that would be a, a single destination, or a cluster might be 10 endpoints where you have a load balanced group of instances that you want to respond behind. Um, and so the general life of a traffic flow is traffic comes in through the listener, it is manipulated by the filters, and there may be multiple filters in place. If it's unpacking sort of HTTP traffic, as an example, it'll look at a series of routes to determine where it needs to go. Those filters and those routes, if applicable, will then direct it to a cluster. And then out of that cluster, it will send traffic to one of the endpoints based on its load balancing algorithm. You know, is it going to be round robin? Is it going to be least number of connections, et cetera, et cetera? Now, where does Envoy get all of this information? Uh, where does it find out about like listeners and routes and clusters and endpoints, right? Um, all of this stuff is going to come from the control plane, but the control plane has to um, translate that into something that Envoy understands. And it does that through these APIs that Envoy um, exposes. And we call these Envoy, the, these APIs, the XDS APIs, right? And when I first started learning Envoy, I was like, XDS, what is, what, what is that? I don't understand, right? You have, you have to think of that X in the XDS as like a variable. It's going to like replace the X with something else, right? Because what we have is a collection of APIs. These are all various discovery services. That's what the DS stands for. And the X could represent any number of things. So we have a cluster discovery service. We have a, a listener discovery service, an endpoint discovery service, a route discovery service. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so rather than referring to the, the CDS and the EDS and the LDS and the SDS and the RDS and blah, 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 we just refer to these things as the XDS APIs, X being something, right? And so every major component of Envoy, uh, every major sort of configuration option has a discovery service API that you can use to pass information down to Envoy from a control plane. So for listeners, you have the listener discovery service or the LDS. And for the clusters, you have the cluster discovery service. And for routes, you have the route discovery service and so forth, right? Um, there is also, not mentioned here, there's also one called the aggregated discovery service, which allows a control plane to kind of pass all of this information down in one big stream. You can think of the ADS as like the big fire hose, right? 
it gets envoy gets all of its configuration across one stream rather than getting it little bits and pieces from various different areas. But the fact is envoy can do either, which is what makes it so powerful and so flexible. Now, um, I'm going to stop here and, and just kind of see if there are any questions before I get into the demos, if everything makes sense, or if you need any additional information. Um, so feel free to chime in uh, for a bit if you have questions or want to know anything. All right, looks like we're good. Um, and I'll just open a chat window here too. So if you don't want to speak up and you just want to type in chat, um, I can see the chat window on my screen. So feel free to just type away in chat if you would like. All right, so I have some demos prepared just to kind of give um, a little more of a you know sort of real world feel, right? Uh, practical uh, feel to what I'm talking about here because so far it's all been like talky, talky, talky. And you, you probably want to see this in sort of like real, real world scenario, right? So I have a series of configurations that I've captured from a live service mesh environment. Um, the demos are not quite live. They're sort of like half live, right? The demos were taken, what I've done is I've captured the configurations from a live environment so that in case I lose my you know, connectivity or something to that environment, I don't have to worry about the demos going dead. Um, but I have the, the, all the files locally on my computer that we're gonna be looking through. So um, what I did is I used uh, Kubernetes uh, 1.20.7. I provisioned this on AWS um, using something called Cluster API, which is like one of my favorite Kubernetes projects ever. So um, love, I could talk days about Cluster API. Um, and on that, I'm running the open source Kuma service mesh, which I installed just using uh, Kuma CTL install control plane. I then deployed a demo app, which is a real, real simple app um, that has like two sections to it, right? A front end and a back end. And then I also added a third service, which I called an echo service, just because I sort of needed three services to be able to show you the different views of what's happening here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically walk you through some of the configurations using these files. And I'm, we're going to use, well, I say I'm going to use curl, but, uh, and I will for a little bit, but then we're going to be using some other very handy uh, CLI tools that I will show you that I have links for, by the way, um, so that you can try them out on your own. Uh, so let's see, where am I? Here we go. Okay. And so some of the useful CLI tools that I'm going to use. Um, I'm a huge terminal fan, right? Just for the record. Um, so I'm going to be using a tool called JQ, um, which is a really, really handy uh, JSON query tool. Um, you can take raw JSON data and you can write a JSON query with it um, using JQ and you can parse down to see like just one little section of what you want, right? Um, XH is a, sort of a replacement for curl. Um, so it's great for like sending HTTP requests to an endpoint. Um, my, my new favorite tool is this the next one is called Gron. And what Gron does is it takes JSON data and it turns it into sort of like a flat file so you can grep it. Um, which is enormously useful. Um, and then we have one called uh, JID or the JSON incremental digger, which is sort of a nice way of um, interactively exploring uh, JSON data. Um, so links for all those are in the chat. Thanks, um, Taryn. Um, and uh, so you'll just see me work through those as I, as I uh, kind of show you what I have up there for you. All right. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're actually gonna look at how we interact with Envoy directly to look at some of the data that it has. So to see what it's configured to do um, by the control plane, okay? Um, and so Envoy exposes this, its own API to be able to query Envoy and say, how are you configured, right? And we call this the admin API. And there's some, um, some key endpoints for the admin API and I have them listed here. So you can run, uh, you can look at the slash clusters API or the endpoint. It'll show you cluster information. Remember that clusters represent destinations for Envoy, right? Um, you can do a slash certs, uh, which will show you a certificate information. So if you're having Envoy do TLS uh, authentication, that kind of stuff. Uh, we have a slash listeners, which will show you the listeners, which is how data gets into Envoy, okay? And then uh, we have the config dump, which is the sort of the, uh, you know, the complete set, the complete view of what Envoy is doing. Now, Warning, there's a lot of detail here, right? Um, and it's not re necessarily recommended to uh, sort of look at config dump from the very beginning. Um, looking at config, config dump, um, I had a colleague of mine say, it's, uh, it's, it's really, really powerful and it'll leave you 
um, waking up uh, in the Ozarks with one shoe, wondering how you got there. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like staring at the sun. Don't, don't do too much, right? Until you're, until you're accustomed to it. Um, now, we are carefully going to peer into config dump, but we will do so in a very controlled fashion. Um, so with that, I'm gonna start out the first demo, which uh, we're gonna be looking at the admin API, right? All right, so uh, can you all see my terminal here? Looks good. Okay, great. So in another window, I'm just going to run a command to, um, actually here, I'm gonna run the command here. And the only reason, uh, I'm gonna do some port forwarding, but I'm gonna show you what I'm doing here. So I have um, my Kubernetes context set, and you can see it in my prompt to a cluster that I'm running called zone one cluster one. Um, and I know that um, I have uh, Kong Mesh, which is the commercial version of the Kuma open source project installed on this system. And so I can look at some pods that are in here and I have some applications running so on and so forth. And so there's a control plane and there's an ingress and I have a demo running in here as well. So if I say get demo, then we have some, some apps here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a port forward to the uh, Envoy admin API um, so that I can actually query Envoy from here, right? I'm gonna run that command in another window because it's gonna be like blocking. And so I won't be able to do anything in this terminal when I run that command. But the basic command I'm going to run is kubectl port forward, and then it's going to it's going to take care of that for me. So uh, let me just type this in right real quick: port forward pod, and we will use this one right here. Okay, so now I have this thing running, and just to kind of show you what it looks like, we're going to uh, actually let me clear my screen first. Okay. Going to use XH, which is that uh, command line tool I talked about sending and receiving data over an API, uh, localhost 9901. And I'll say, give me the cluster's endpoint. And you'll see like a whole bunch of data come back, right? This is all live from the Envoy data plane running in my Kubernetes cluster on AWS right now. Um, and you can see that, you know, I've got a whole bunch of different um, clusters here. And so, some of these clusters represent actual portions of the application like this. Some of them represent sort of um, other ways that uh, Envoy gets configured like this pass through for IPv4. Um, and some of them represent things like where I send my access logs, right? But all of these are used by a cluster. Now I did wanna show you one thing that you'll find interesting. Remember I talked about this aggregated discovery service which passes all that configuration data down to Envoy. Well, that is itself represented as a cluster. And so you can see right here, we have an ADS or aggregated discovery service cluster that tells Envoy where to get its configuration data from. So, um, all right. So you can see lots of data there. And if I were to say, okay, show me the listener data as well. Here's all my listeners. And again, you can see these listeners are defined as you know, inbound traffic, outbound traffic. They have an IP address. They have a port associated with them. Um, and that's how traffic gets into Envoy, right? Um, and as we continue to explore the Envoy configuration, which I will do so in, in 20 minutes or less, um, then you'll see how we actually connect listeners to clusters in order to basically complete the chain from data coming into Envoy to data coming out of Envoy to bound for some destination. So, um, and we're doing all that just by querying this um, 9901, uh, port, which I'm port forwarding from my local machine. That's why I'm querying localhost. I'm port forwarding from my local machine to a pod on my Kubernetes cluster on AWS. Um, all right. So that's sort of the first demo is just having a look at what we can do with the admin API. Now, for the second demonstration, um, what I'm doing, I'm looking at this is now this next thing I'm going to show you. I'm using something that's specific to um, the Kuma mesh here, but I'm using it to illustrate a different concept. And so this, I want to point out that the, some of the details of what I show you here for Envoy configuration is particular to um, how Kuma or Kong Mesh configures Istio, uh, Envoy, right? Istio might configure a little bit differently. Glue might configure a little bit differently, um, that kind of thing. But the basics of a listener with routes and filters and clusters remains the same. It's all, they're, they're, you're going to see that with Envoy across any service mesh that uses Envoy. Okay, but in in the in, in Kuma and Kong Mesh, we have this idea of um, telling Envoy what kind of protocol 
it can expect on a particular traffic, picture type of traffic, right? And so what we're going to do here is we're going to see what happens when I switch from um, Envoy being a layer four proxy and just working on the TCP or UDP port to being a layer seven proxy and working on the HTTP traffic itself, okay? So, uh, alrighty, let's clear this. So I have some files and these files represent uh, a capture of the configuration of Envoy before I make the change so I can show you what it looks like and after I make the change so you can see how it changed it and what was different, okay? Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do um, is uh, I'm going to I'm going to use this this um, this uh, Gron tool that I mentioned right to pull out um, information about the listeners. Now because I'm doing this sort of uh, uh, you know semi-recorded, I'm using files that I captured. First, let's look at what the listener data actually looks like. And so you see, I have a few files that are like app listeners or echo listeners, whatever, right? So I say app listeners before, um, and this is the capture of the listener configuration before I made the change. So let's just see what this file looks like. And so what I see here is these are the listeners that were configured on this cluster at this time. And I'm looking for um, a, um, let's see, I'm looking for the, the um, configuration for, um, for a particular service, a listener um, on port, uh, probably on port 8080 is what I'm gonna look for here. So we, have, we can see we have a few that are looking at port 8080, right? Um, we have an outbound one here um, looking for port 8080. So let's see what we can figure out about that particular port. Um, so um, if I were to show you the whole configuration, uh, let's see, app dump before, so bat, it'll, uh, no, I don't need to do that bad, app dump before, um, then, there's gonna be a, a whole ton of stuff here. We can't look through all of this. Like this is just too much, right? So this is where we're gonna, we're gonna to begin to filter it down using some of these tools I talked about. So first thing we're gonna do is we're going to, um, we're gonna make this greppable, like searchable, so we can find the specific thing we're looking for. That's where this Gron tool comes in. So you tell Gron, uh, here's, here's the data, the, the JSON data that I want you to flatten out. And then you use grep to say what you wanna look for. And we want to look for, um, let's see, a lot of stuff here. Let me scroll back up. I think I want to look for this IP address right here. So let's copy that. And we'll paste that in. All right. And so um, what you see here now is Gron sort of flattened out the JSON data, lets us grep for it. And then the nice thing about it is it shows us the path of where this thing is. Like notice it just shows us well, it's in the configs array, it's in the dynamic listeners array. Now, the reason this is super useful is because this gives us the specific query to use using something like JQ to pull out just that section of the configuration data, which is super handy, right? So if I run JQ now and I say, I want you to show me just the second part of the configs array and just number 12 out of the dynamic listeners array, from this file, uh, let me just page it, okay? Then now I see, I can scroll back and forth and I have just that section of the configuration, right? So I've, I've taken like this massive, massive configuration and I've gotten just this one piece that we wanna look at. So here we have um, a listener for this service that's running on port 8080. Now I know this service is a web service, it's running HTTP but the service mesh, and then by extension, Envoy doesn't know that, okay? And so when you look at how it's configured, remember as I said, every listener has some filters. Notice here we have a filter listened and notice the filter says TCP proxy, right? So all that Envoy knows is that there is some kind of traffic running on TCP port 80. That's all it knows. It doesn't know what kind of traffic it is or anything of the nature. So it can't make any sort of more intelligent discussions about what or decisions about what to do with this traffic because all it knows is TCP port 80. I don't know anything more about it. Okay, now 
this the 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 kuma and kong mesh service meshes they have an ability for us to you know change that to inform the mesh what kind of traffic that is so after i make the change i go and i look at the same section of the configuration after i make the change and then i want to draw your attention right here to this filter right it's no longer a tcp proxy filter now it's an http connection manager filter so now the service mesh and by extension envoy knows that it's http traffic and knows that it can do more things with it so now look at how we have a bunch of extra data like before when it was just a, a layer four proxy we couldn't make decisions about routing or hosts or anything else of that nature now that the um the envoy data proxy knows that it's http traffic we can add stuff like virtual hosts and routes and all that kind of stuff and so this is that distinction that i showed you in the slide deck let me flip back over there real quick right where we were looking at these two types of um sets of objects right that upper set of object is is uh envoy acting as a layer four proxy and that bottom one is envoy acting as a layer seven proxy specifically for http traffic so hopefully that makes sense um so that's just one example of how you can see you make some changes to the way a service is defined in kubernetes or in the service mesh or whatever and that gets filtered down to envoy and you'll see changes in the listener you'll see changes in the filters that are associated with that listener or you might see changes in the cluster depending on what it is you're doing right uh, all right so let me get out of this okay there we go um all right and i don't see any questions in the chat so i'm just going to keep on booking um let's see so now for the third example uh we're going to use uh, something called a circuit breaker policy okay um, and in this case, whereas before we saw a change on the listener, which affected inbound traffic into Envoy, now we're going to see a change on a cluster, which represents a destination. Okay. So let me uh, get over here. And so I have another set of demo files prepared. And so same sort of scenario here, but in the interest of time, I will, uh, you know, sort of skip some of the preliminary work that I showed you before. And I'll pull out just the specific data that I want you to see. So when I'm looking at clusters, I'm going to be looking in a slightly different place. Uh, let's see. Um, nine. All right. Um, Okay, so here we're looking at a particular cluster. Um, and uh, I want to draw your attention to this circuit breaker section right here. And in particular, the thresholds where we can specify maximum number of connections, maximum number of pending requests, maximum number of retry requests, so on and so forth. This is how Envoy sets a, sets a, an upper limit, a threshold for how much traffic is in there. And, and if for some reason you end up with any of these uh, thresholds being exceeded, then uh, Envoy will stop sending traffic to that cluster because it's you, you've reached the most you can handle, not going to send any more, right? And the idea being there is it will prevent a failure in that particular component from cascading to other components by um, returning invalid data or errors or anything of that nature. Now, um, most service meshes have a way of configuring these thresholds. And so if I look at that same section after applying a circuit breaker policy that does configure this then you will notice look at that these numbers all change right um, and that's because i applied a policy that changed that right uh, i i reconfigured the service mesh to say i wanted to do something let me see if i have that policy applied um, i do so i can say here is the policy now again this specific definition is particular to Kuma and Kong Mesh, you'd see something similar for Glue or Istio or one of the others. But we specified here that we wanted to configure those thresholds to be lower. And when we applied the policy, that got translated down into the appropriate section inside Envoy, right? Um, so super useful, I think, just to kind of see how sections in a service mesh configuration get translated down into the data plane, which is actually responsible for passing the traffic back and forth. All right, um, I have one final um, demo 
Um, and we're, we're almost uh, out of time, but I think I can squeeze this last demo in here. So let's, let's do it real quick. Now in this last one, um, I'm doing uh, another type of policy. In this case, I'm applying a type of policy that allows us to control uh, what kind of traffic uh, or traffic from what services are allowed to talk to what other services. And in the Kuma Kong mesh world, we call this a traffic permission policy. It may have a different name in other service meshes, but almost all of them do this in some fashion. And a lot of times this is tied to like an MTLS identity. So it'll take a certificate, it'll have that services identity on that certificate, and then it'll use that certificate to authenticate to the other service to say, I am who I say I am. I am the, you know, the admin API or I am the people API or whatever it is, right? And, um, and so um, in this case, we're going to look at, let's see, um, just checking my notes here. Uh, okay. So um, let's look at uh, configs. We're going to look at a listener again. Um, Uh, oh, let me page that so we can. Okay, so here we have a listener. It's going to a service that's running on port 5000. Now notice that it recognizes this as HTTP traffic. We can tell that by the filter that is installed. And therefore we have routes in there. And notice in this case, we have a route configuration which says there are certain headers that I want you to remove and certain headers I want you to add. We have um, a specific route and a, and a cluster or a destination for that route, right? Um, but I also want to point out that, um, that that's really all there is. Like there's nothing else there, right? We have the route configuration and that's it. Now, I can apply a policy that says only allow traffic from one, one service to another service, right? So I can say, uh, let's see if I do this. I can say that I only want the demo app to be able to talk to the Redis component of the application, right? And if I then look at that same configuration after I apply this policy, I still see, you know, for the most part, everything looks the same here. I'm still seeing, um, you know, the address in the 5,000, but then the notice right up front, we have an RBAC filter, right? RBAC, if you're not aware, stands for like role-based access control. It's a, it's a way of enforcing who or what is allowed to, to communicate or to do something. And notice it says, that it wants a specific principle, this principle listed here, this is what we call a spiffy principle, and that's encoded on the MTLS certificate. And so it's saying, hey, you don't get access to this unless you have this identity on your certificate, right? So this is guaranteeing that whatever traffic coming into this service, into this listener, wants to connect here is not going to be allowed to connect unless it has a certain identity on its certificate. And this is a way of guaranteeing the authentic authenticity and integrity of data coming between services. And this is why we talk about mutual TLS is that service A can say, I am service A and I have a certificate to prove that. And service B can say, I see your certificate and I see that that's valid and it's, and it's authentic and I'm going to allow traffic to go through. Um, and so this is an example of that like in action, right? Uh, of the RBAC piece, which by the way, note is listed first. And this is because it wants to take that RBAC action first before it gets down here to the connection manager and then starts to process that HTTP traffic to say, where does it need to go, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's gonna drop that traffic even before it starts parsing it if it's not authenticated traffic. Um, and then again, we see the routes and all of that. So that's an example of how you know, Envoy gets configured to you to do things like drop, dropping traffic in response to a policy. So um, now we're gonna make not only the recording of this available, but also these slides available as a PDF. And so you'll have access to all of these links, but I'll just talk about them really quick. Um, lots of useful Envoy information out there. This just barely scratches the surface of all the information that's out there. Now, in some ways, there's so much information out there that it's hard to sift through and find what's really useful. So hopefully some of these links for those of you who are from who are new to Envoy will be useful because it at least gets you sort of a grounding enough to know that you know you're not going to feel overwhelmed when you go out and you search for Envoy configuration and you like you get this mountain of Google results that towers over you, right? Um, so the Envoy site itself, Envoy Proxy.io, their docs are really, really good. 
they are extraordinarily extensive. So don't get overwhelmed when you go to their doc site. Like anything and everything you ever wanted to know is documented there. That's a lot. <laughs> so um, I found it useful to start at the terminology and just to, to kind of say like, what do they mean when they say a cluster? What's upstream? What's downstream? What's a listener, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, the Istio Weekly uh, YouTube show um, has a great section on Envoy Fundamentals. That video runs about 45 minutes or so, but it's pretty useful. Envoy, the project also has some sandboxes. So if you have a machine and you have Docker, um, they give you some sandboxes. You can run Docker Compose and turn up Envoy and look at its configuration and test it and that kind of stuff. Um, I also found this, um, I, I don't want to call it a random site, but it's a third party person who's writing about Envoy. Um, uh, this fourth link to be really, really useful again. And, um, and then finally the Envoy Proxy Docs, again, the life of a request which does walk you through how traffic moves from listener to filter um, to route, if appropriate, then to cluster and endpoint, that kind of thing. So um, hopefully these resources will be, would be useful. And again, you'll be able to get to these through the PDF of the presentation and or watching the recording later on. So. All right, thank you so much, Scott. Um, that was an awesome presentation, and I think everyone will really appreciate all of those additional resources as well. Um, if you have any feedback or any questions, please reach out to Scott. Um, he's on Twitter. Make sure and follow him. Uh, follow his blog as well, um, and he even has his GitHub link there. So thank you all so much for joining today, and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.